With five games under the series' belt and a burgeoning multimedia franchise underway, it's safe to say the Layton series was more successful than what could have been reasonably expected. In just five short years, Level 5 had managed to produce title after title, earning the franchise over 11 million units in sales worldwide by the time of Miracle Mask's release in Japan. Of course, the success of the franchise had been anything but gradual. Curious Village had managed to sell 700,000 units in Japan on its release, an unmitigated success for the DS at the time, and a feat they would repeat with Diabolical Box. Professor Layton and the Miracle Mask feels like the first game in the series to really reflect on the status of the franchise. In its opening moments, Layton tells Luke some surprising facts about Monte Dor, the main hub of the game. Indeed, in only 18 years, this little desert oasis has grown into quite a tourist attraction. Amazing, don't you think? Yes, it <gasps> is. Some people even call it the City of Miracles. The first, and arguably central, mystery of the game revolves around just this fact, how it could be possible to build something from nothing in such a short amount of time. It's difficult to tell whether Layton is referring to the city or his own franchise. Layton's not the only one wondering either. In an Iwata Asks interview with series producer Akihiro Hino, Iwata himself notes the rapid speeds at which Level 5 manages to output their titles, with Hino later suggesting he feels the urge to release a new game franchise every year. The results speak for themselves. While Level 5 released the first four games in three years, the build-up to Miracle Mask was the longest hiatus the Layton franchise had seen to that point, a whole two years for development. And in that time, the game had managed to make the leap from 2D to 3D in order to serve as one of the launch titles for the 3DS in Japan. This, on top of the fact that it was also the longest Layton game to date. With results this impressive, it wouldn't be too much to suggest the Layton franchise was a franchise of miracles. Yet Miracle Mask represents an interesting turning point for the Layton series. In the same Iwata Asks interview, Hino notes that the jump to the 3DS granted him an opportunity to do something new with the games. Importantly, he also thought this newness would be differentially felt. I think the more seasoned the Professor Layton player, the more different they'll feel. Hino's assessment is correct, for reasons which seem to have gone underappreciated for some time. Miracle Mask, in more and less subtle ways, shifts the narrative and design philosophies of the series that would be felt in nearly all of the future games to come. Least subtly are the new 3D graphics. Akin to other franchises, many have argued that Professor Layton had a rough transition into 3D, albeit more literally in this case. It's not hard to see why people would say this. The character models in Miracle Mask are, let it be said, not the prettiest things in the world. There's something particularly clumsy about them, the extremely thick outlines on all the models popping in and out of existence depending on the angle, animations which tend to play with far too much frequency while a character is talking, and geometry that seems to clip together frequently. The new motion capture cutscenes are pretty uncanny too, and the less said about Layton's pointer finger the better. In recent years, however, I find myself growing more fond of Miracle Mask's aesthetic. The weirdness of the character models extends to the backgrounds, which look significantly more exaggerated than in previous titles. Monte Dor is peppered with impossible architecture, from the extravagant Reunion Inn to the spindly, uneven columns of the Monsartan Gallery. One of my favorite locations, Chance Avenue, features a cavalcade of huge neon signs, clogging up the screen for your attention. Taken all together, Miracle Mask almost has a certain expressionistic quality to it, emphasizing the bustling, larger-than-life nature of Monte Dor. It might not be the prettiest game in the world, but I also can't think of many other games that look quite like it. Monte Dor is perhaps the most foreign location the series has seen yet. While prior Layton games brought us to quaint rural villages and towns, barring the famous city of London, Miracle Mask decides to take us to a new place, America. The streets of Monte Dor are clearly based off of Las Vegas, with the city surrounded by miles of giant desert. And, despite the game's protestations that were obviously still in England somehow, nevertheless, it does fit Hino's idea of the Professor Layton series taking place in a contrived sort of England, so I suppose New World of Steam can still take the title for first Layton game in America. 
The choice of locale serves to differentiate Miracle Mask from its predecessors, while also hinting at the more expansive journey the series would embark on in Azran Legacy. But these changes are all relatively surface level and uncontroversial. None of them suggest a radically different feeling for the longtime fans as Hino suggested it would. No, to find that, we have to examine the more controversial aspects of the game. Like all the prequel games, there's a certain dismissive attitude to the new things the trilogy brought to the table. Not that these games are hated by any stretch, but the merits of each game's particular approach tends to be ignored, in favor of a disfavorable comparison towards the original trilogy. And no better can this be seen than with the case of The Masked Gentleman. If there's one criticism that has plagued the discussion around Miracle Mask, it's the identity of The Masked Gentleman. The claim generally goes that most of the game is spent solving a mystery that is blatantly obvious. We all know who the masked gentleman is long before the reveal at the end of the game, so much of our time feels like wasted effort. But is this really the case? Is the identity of the masked gentleman really that obvious? I yeah, it's obviously Randall. It's just so obviously Randall. From the moment Leighton utters the name Randall, every single person playing knows it could not possibly be anyone else but Randall. Even excluding knowledge about common tropes and storytelling, and that a supposedly but maybe not actually long-lost friend of Herschel Leighton will probably play an important role in the mystery, there are a number of other mind-numbingly obvious clues that it's Randall. For one, the game repeatedly emphasizes the masked gentleman's connection to the residents of Stansbury, with the masked gentleman giving personalized letters to Henry, Leighton, and Dalston about the whereabouts of the next dark miracle. It's revealed that much of the construction of Montedor was due to Henry's belief that Randall would return to Montedor in some way, so much so that he named the first building in the city the Reunion Inn, emphasis on reunion. The song that plays within the Lador Manor is entitled Expectation. What might they be expecting, I wonder? The masked gentleman and Randall literally share the same voice actor, Yuri Lowenthal. There's not even a filter applied as some kind of superficial gesture to hide the fact that they're the same voice actor. And this really is just scratching the surface in terms of the number of obvious cues the game throws our way. In fact, there are so many clues that the idea that the masked gentleman's identity is too obvious becomes a fairly uncharitable perspective. When people say this, the implication is that there's some kind of structural storytelling flaw. On the surface, this makes sense. Mysteries prize themselves on keeping the suspense. The suspense, that is, of a whodunit or a howdunit. Leighton games rely on this kind of suspense even more so, with ridiculous final act plot twists that completely recontextualize everything about the game. No one could have possibly expected the true nature of Full Sense in Diabolical Box or the secret of time travel in Unwound Future. So for Miracle Mass to rely so heavily on a mystery so obvious, how could it be anything but a betrayal of the core appeal of the series? On the other hand, just look at the evidence here. This cutscene happens in Chapter 2. <laughs> what exactly could a scene like this possibly be conveying, other than Randall is the masked gentleman? And how much evidence must be presented, short of the game actually telling us that the masked gentleman is Randall, before we start to think, maybe this game is trying to do something a little different? And it is here where the acute difference which Hino suggested can be found. The identity of the masked gentleman is not too obvious, it is instead a very intentional maneuver made to bring out the real nature of Miracle Mask's central mystery. You're supposed to know who the masked gentleman is, and this fact is reinforced by the very structure of the game. The central mysteries in Leighton games have a particular set of characteristics. They're usually presented as some sort of magical, otherworldly event, like a box that kills people by opening it time travel to the future, or an evil spirit attacking a town. We then spend the rest of the game collecting seemingly unrelated evidence, only for the final act to tie all the game's mysteries together, and reveal that the thing we thought was otherworldly was actually far more mundane than we realized. At first, Miracle Mass seems to follow this pattern. The gentleman's dark miracles clearly fulfill the role of this otherworldly inciting incident, and an astute Leighton player will probably assume the rest of the game will be spent attempting to figure out how the gentleman is able to achieve these feats. But the game quickly diverges from this template. In prior games, the mechanics of the central mystery were always left for the ending barrage of cutscenes. Think of the explanation of the timeline of events as we climb up the tower in Curious Village, or the specter's appearances within the fog in Last Spectre. 
But things work very differently in Miracle Mask. As early as the third chapter, Leighton is dissecting each of the gentlemen's dark miracles in excruciating detail, positing some of the most plausible ideas for how they could be achieved in Leighton history. Even though we don't uncover the truth behind all of the miracles, the scene makes one key point. The dark miracles are bogus, nothing more than expensive magic tricks made up by a charlatan. Indeed, every subsequent miracle begins with Leighton asking how the gentleman was able to fake this one, and the dark miracles are the only mysteries of the game which are resolved before entering the final act. In other Leighton games, this would be the equivalent of revealing future London is underground before even stepping foot in Chinatown. Miracle Mask takes things a step further. One key ingredient of any Leighton plot twist is the classic pointing scene, where Leighton reveals the true mastermind behind the scenes. In a game where the central mystery ostensibly is the identity of a masked figure, it seems obvious that this pointing scene should be dedicated to this reveal. And yet it's not. In fact, the scene where Randall reveals himself is almost completely nonchalant. Well, I suppose I won't be needing this anymore. pains me to see you like this, Randall." Rather than shocked tones and exclaimed gasps, the scene instead plays out with a sense of somber disappointment and resignation. And why should there be any surprises? It's worth pointing out that Angela, on two separate occasions, says she had a hunch that the gentleman was Randall in the first place, and that's the entire reason why she contacted Leighton. The entire game literally happens because someone already knew who the masked gentleman was. Leighton isn't surprised because he figured out the gentleman's identity long before this reveal. We aren't surprised because we know too. All of these facts should key into the idea that Miracle Mask finds very little mysterious about the surface level details of the masked gentleman. It should also indicate that Miracle Mask's central mystery has very little to do with the who's and what's of the masked gentleman. More so than prior Leighton games, Miracle Mask is a decidedly more character-centric game, and its interests lie in the psychology of those characters. This is why, in the final exposition dump, Leighton does not discuss the mechanics of the Dark Miracles, but rather the nature of Henry and Angela's relationship. This is why Leighton catches Descalay not over some technical, factual detail Descalay got wrong, but because he failed to understand Angela as a person. It is also why the game needs to ensure the player understands who the masked gentleman is long before the finale of the game. The central mystery of Miracle Mask is not a who or what, but a why. Why would a friend of Leighton and company work so hard to ruin and belittle them? What would compel Randall to do something like this? But the game can't even begin to broach these questions if it hasn't already been made clear who the gentleman is in the first place. And if it doesn't do that early, then it means a majority of the game will have to be spent on questions Miracle Mask doesn't really care about. On a broader level, Miracle Mask's story would be largely incomprehensible if the game did a better job at hiding Randall's identity. It would render three entire chapters of the game as confusing filler. Why should I care about Leighton's friend if it's not clear how that relates to the mystery in the present in any way? Characters in Miracle Mask treat Randall's death as a mark of shame. Leighton barely wants to talk about it, and Angela ghosts Leighton for 18 years as a consequence of it. It's a perspective that makes a lot of sense. It is a silent guilt. People who all suspect the truth but never say it, aware that if they did, they would have to reckon with the idea that the person terrorizing Monte Dor is a direct consequence of their own recklessness. Otherwise, this perspective is instead pointless melodrama, all of which is to say that the criticism that the masked gentleman's identity is too obvious misses the point, and ignores the ways in which the game more subtly states its intentions to the players. Since I've repeatedly maintained that Miracle Mask places greater emphasis on its characters, then it would probably be a good idea to say something about how the game goes about doing that. Miracle Mask doesn't just place a greater focus on its main cast, it also bleeds into and amplifies the supporting cast around it as well. Leighton games have always had an eccentric group of one-off NPCs roaming around, but Monte Dora seems to have a much tighter and coherent grasp on them. They all seem to have their opinions on Monte Dor and the latest Dark Miracle, and were often privy to their thought process as the game progresses. 
Niles theorizes that the masked gentleman is some kind of publicity stunt and is wholly unimpressed with the dark miracles. Maddie becomes obsessed about the gentleman, trying to learn about the next miracle as soon as she can to get front row seats. We repeatedly speak to a troupe of clowns that perform throughout Monte Dor, each with their own perspectives on life and their jobs. Two thieves repeatedly try to extort Leighton with shell games and underhanded puzzles, which of course Leighton sees right through. Miracle Mask does a particularly good job sketching out Monte Dor's residence from the two and done conversations that were commonplace in prior Leighton games. But what's most striking about Miracle Mask's character work is a certain brutalness that defines many of the characters' perspectives. Dalston speculates wildly about the real nature of the Lador's marriage, stating that Angela clearly married Henry because she blames Henry for Randall's death and sets up the gentleman so she could backstab him and exact her revenge. Ironically, Dalston ends up being sort of correct, though it's not the true Angela that's trying to backstab him. Henry accuses Leighton of betraying the memory of Randall and abandoning the rest of his friends to pursue his career. While previous Leighton games certainly had character disagreements, there's something more personal and hostile here, as the characters attempt to apply the most uncharitable motivations onto their former friends. It gives the game a more potent edge, demonstrating just how much the incident with Randall has impacted each of them, without the game having to outright say it. But the real stars of Miracle Mask are the four characters that the game spends the most time analyzing, Leighton, Henry, Randall, and Angela. And for the most part, Miracle Mask is largely successful, finding rather interesting things to say. Herschel Leighton has always been a particularly appealing character. In the first two games, this was because Leighton was a polite, reasonable, affable individual, which are instantly endearing characteristics. One might almost argue that Leighton was a little too perfect in these games. Unwound Future gave him some needed backstory, tragic backstory at that, but instead of feeling cheap, the backstory worked because it amplified exactly what was so likable about the character. Unwound Future showed Leighton at the beginning of his adult life, applying for a teaching job, falling in love, telling jokes. He was a little awkward and indecisive, but clearly well-meaning. Importantly though, it was normal. The average day of Herschel Layton looked a lot like the average day of a lot of people, while still providing a character that was coherent with the Layton we know in the games. Unwound Future showed that Layton wasn't just some incredible superhuman genius, as what might have been gathered from playing the first two games, but a genuinely nice person who does normal things, and that only increased his relatability. Miracle Mask employs a similar trick giving us three whole chapters set in Leighton's late teenage years, just before moving to London. And like Unwound Future, the game does a good job making Leighton a likable person. He fences as a hobby, he goes to classes he's bored by, he makes sarcastic quips at his friends. While not exactly a rebellious teenage phase, Miracle Mask characterizes Leighton as an exasperated teen, figuring out what he wants to do in life. While Leighton doesn't have a character arc per se, Miracle Mask offers by far the most characterization for Leighton in the entire series, and it serves to give him a psychological complexity that challenges the notion of Leighton as some unfeeling, completely analytical figure. The discovery that would have made you famous. I told no one of it. It shall forever remain our secret. Here is what you sacrificed your life for. It's yours. Henry, on the other hand, is presented as a much more cold, distant person. Despite his importance to the narrative, he is mysteriously absent for most of the first half of the game. His two appearances consist of suspicious glares, and his first line of dialogue is him arresting Dalston, for what Dalston understandably argues is completely self-interested motives. Yet Henry remains one of the more fascinating characters in the story. The game seems obsessed with Henry's role as a servant. Randall points out that his father keeps Henry on a tight leash, keeping him busy with a constant churn of errands while forbidding him any sort of leisure time. He only sees Henry as our butler, Randall suggests. Earlier, Dalston states how pitiful it is that the Ascot servant is so young, yet already working for someone else. These characteristics appear to have followed him into the future. When visiting Henry's study, Angela describes how Henry always keeps the study in pristine condition, not even allowing his own servants to enter. Apparently, cleaning is Henry's hobby. We also have the servants, but Henry does most of the work. 
When Leighton visits Henry later on, Henry makes tea himself, stating, You're very welcome. I would never ask a servant to wait on an old acquaintance. You may find that a bit strange, but I hope it doesn't make you uncomfortable. Miracle Mass seems decidedly uneasy about this servant business, a sense in which Miracle Mass thinks Henry is little more than a glorified slave, a personalityless blank slate, a receptacle meant to pick up the week's groceries and little else. This understanding forms the basis for why the game insists Randall is so important to Henry. While characters in the game often make mention of Henry, it is usually only in the context of certain empirical matters, like where he is or how his businesses are doing at the time. To the people of Stansbury and Monte Dor, Henry is merely a data point, and not a person of legitimate consideration. That even despite his success in building Monte Dor from the ground up, he is still the lowly servant of the Ascot family. Indeed, as we find out later in the game, after Randall's disappearance and his father's death, Henry offered to take care of Mrs. Ascot, now acting as her caretaker in Monte Dor. Randall, however, is the sole exception. When Randall speaks of Henry, it is to comment on how responsible and hardworking he is. It's to talk about his interests and hobbies. In the finale of the game, we're shown a scene in which Henry is chastised by one of the Ascot's servants for playing with Randall's toy. Instead of letting Henry take the criticism, however, Randall defends him, creating a nonsense story about how he actually gave the toy to Henry in the first place, and she has no right to take it from him. In hindsight, it's clear why such a simple moment should act as the story's linchpin. It is the first moment in which Henry felt he had been treated not as an instrumental tool, but as an actual human being. And that is why Henry decided to build Monte Dor in Randall's honor. One could argue Miracle Mask is more the story of Henry than the story of Randall, but that doesn't mean the game doesn't get some interesting mileage out of Randall himself. He's the victim of an elaborate manipulation. After losing his memory during the Akbadine expedition, he's fed letters from Descale informing him of his previous life. These letters tell him an exaggerated tale about what he once had, and how greedy manipulators had stolen it all away from him. The result of that manipulation is clear to see. In perhaps the most powerful scenes in the entire series, Randall lays out his feelings for his former friends through thinly veiled children's stories hidden about the Reunion Inn. While the stories start off unassuming, they quickly become something more sinister. One story recounts a man raising a dog from nothing, leaving to become a famous archaeologist and returning to town after his newfound success. The man learns that his family had been run out by a wild dog, and his hometown eventually became a mere husk of its former self. The man, stricken by grief, ventures into the forest to disappear forever. The words, THE END, capitalized and bolded, appear to punctuate the conclusion. The metaphor is obvious, as Henry's expedition to Norba led to the founding of Monte Dor, leading to the depopulation of their childhood home. It's a harmful piece of writing, casting Henry as a rabid animal that only succeeded because someone was unfortunate enough to take pity on it. But the vitriol continues. The next story casts Henry as a poor beggar, one whom the richest man in town took pity on, giving him a small business of his own. However, the beggar became greedy, and using his newfound popularity, began to build extravagant palaces in the town, and extorted the villagers by buying up all the major food sources and selling it back at ridiculous prices. Forcing the villagers to leave, the beggar realized he now found himself alone in a palace of hollow luxury, and there, his vast loneliness, as open as the sea, swallowed him whole. In the European version of Miracle Mask, the story concludes with a single line, All's well that ends well. It is the apex of Miracle Mask's brutal characterizations, a mad screed celebrating the suicide of a treacherous beggar. There are more stories scattered across the Reunion Inn, but the picture is clear enough. It's Randall's perspective laid bare, and these brief narrative interludes are amongst the most memorable moments in the series, a rare moment in a game where it asks the player to decode the metaphor for themselves. It's also yet another example of why the game needs the player to understand who the gentleman is long before the reveal. Without that knowledge, these stories are robbed of their impact and hatred. They become little more than cryptic gibberish. The stories work because you know it's Randall writing them. Which just leaves Angela. Angela is appealing for many of the same reasons Leighton is appealing. She's a friendly, reasonable person who tries her best to understand the people around her. 
Unfortunately, Angela is also a tragically mishandled character, mistreated by the story mostly because she is so forgotten. While significant time is dedicated to explaining what Henry finds appealing about Randall, the game devotes very little reason for Angela. Other than being his girlfriend, it's unclear what exactly Angela finds so meaningful about Randall that she would dedicate nearly two decades of her life to prepare for his return. On the contrary, the only evidence we have is that it was simply the better of two less than stellar options. As one late game reveal, after Randall's disappearance, Angela's parents began pressuring her to marry Dalston and move out. Distraught by this prospect, Angela becomes somewhat relieved when Henry suggests they pretend to get married while they attempt to find Randall, to hopefully stave off her parents. By Angela's own admission, Henry vowed that he would protect and preserve everything of yours. There's something profoundly depressing about this admission, that the two should co-sign a fake marriage and put a freeze on their entire lives, all for a day that might never come. Never explore any other relationships, never live anywhere else but a few miles away from where you've always lived. But while Henry gets his emotional catharsis and an entire city's worth of businesses, it's a lot more unclear what Angela does next. Does she just become Randall's girlfriend again, even though he's essentially a completely different person at this point? What was Angela really waiting for here? The game never answers. It barely seems like the game cares. It's made worse by the fact that Angela is barely in the game at all. She's replaced by a disguised Descalay almost immediately, which Leighton places as the second time we meet her in Chapter 3. For most of the finale, Angela is disguised as Morty. That means, excluding the Stansbury chapters, Angela only really appears as herself a grand total of two times throughout the entire game. For a character who is supposed to be one of the game's major pillars, this distribution seems about as unstable as the architecture of the Reunion Inn. It also means the game can't meaningfully interrogate what Miracle Mask does best, exploring the inner psychology of its characters. What if Angela started to feel differently about the whole thing? What if, after 18 years of a fake marriage, it became something more real? Would the game really insist Angela still go along with Randall? There's a scene in the second chapter, where Leighton and Angela are walking down a trail together. Leighton suggests that Angela seems to balance out Randall's more excitable personality. Angela retorts, Is balanced the same as boring? It's a scathing question. The kind of question that gnaws, that tears right at the heart of a person's essence. Am I a boring person? Do people actually enjoy being around me, or do they do it because I just happened to be there at the time? Do I have anything worthwhile to offer at all? It's a heartbreaking question, but what's most heartbreaking is that it feels like Miracle Mask is asking the same question of Angela herself. In some ways, Miracle Mask feels like it's asking the same question of itself, too. The Layton series appeals to a very wide audience, and that's the intention. Returning to the gift that keeps on giving, Hino stated that when designing Curious Village for the DS, he understood that many of the people playing the DS were not traditional gamers, but a more casual audience. Thus, the Layton games were made to be playable by just about everyone, even someone with zero literacy with the medium. Does this balance make Professor Layton a more boring series? There's a sense in which this approach might have had some subtle consequences. Despite the popularity of the franchise, the Professor Layton series doesn't seem to have quite the cultural cachet it should. Compared to series like Ace Attorney, Professor Layton doesn't seem to permeate many online discussions, and there are precious few channels on YouTube that seem interested in covering the games, even ones who play visual novels. It's likely this indifference is resultant from the wide appeal the series strove for. The people who played the games have long since exited the conversation, and have little reason to come back. For the rest of the internet, it seems like the series is really just a novel curiosity at this point. The 3DS titles, then, seem to be an attempt to ease a more casual audience into a more traditional game-like experience. The last two entries in the prequel trilogy are wildly more adventurous in the types of situations they place you in, like sudden horse riding minigames in the intro, reflecting an appeal perhaps to a less casual audience. The most obvious example of this is the game's sixth chapter, which sees Leighton traveling down an ancient ruin in an almost rogue-like experience, dodging enemies and pushing boulders down every corridor. It's the most ambitious gameplay shift the series would ever attempt. 
However, there's also the sense that the game isn't quite comfortable with this change of pace. Chapter 6 is extremely over-tutorialized, explaining even the most mundane mechanics to the player in excruciating detail, likely to ensure even the most casual of players wouldn't feel lost, forced into something they didn't sign up for. Still, the experiment is neat, certainly not long enough to be offensive, and it fits neatly with the idea that Miracle Mask is trying to change up the typical latent experience. But there's one more way in which Miracle Mask attempts to draw in a more dedicated audience. The prequel trilogy as a whole is a more connected set of games than the original trilogy, and nowhere is this more clear than the obvious table setting that permeates Miracle Mask. The Azran Legacy, a myth researched by Rutledge, serves as the centerpiece for Randall's interest in the Mast of Chaos. The Azran are a key part of the goings-on in Miracle Mask, but they are never fully developed. We're told Leighton's parents are accosted by strange men in black suits, looking to find an ancient Azran wall in Stansbury. Leonard Bloom is revealed to be in league with a strange figure, who explicitly calls out locations from the prior game and the movie. Then there's just the entire last cutscene. Miracle Mask makes it extremely clear that it's building up to a finale, and that you're gonna have to stick around. It is without a doubt the most continuity-heavy Leighton game, barring Azran Legacy. It should be clear now why Hino suggested Miracle Mask would feel pretty different to long-term Leighton fans. While it often looks and sounds like traditional Leighton, it brings that template into a new dimension, literally and figuratively. It is a more grandiose game, with more ambitious aims, offering perhaps the most richly developed characters in the series. And while all of the game's aims may not be perfectly realized, it's hard not to be impressed with the results, especially considering the time it took to make them. Miracle Mask is an underrated entry in the Layton series, a curious and inventive title that alters the dramatic angle of the series while still feeling completely recognizable. It's a surprisingly emotional and pointed tale, especially in its smaller moments. And yes, the masked gentleman's identity is obvious. That's a good thing.